I'm going to pull out my notes. So I pinned some links up in the Book of Translation, Translation chat. Um, and those are a couple of sources. Um, and I will explain a little bit more about what they are. Um, so just to give a brief outline about today's discussion, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and experience to give credence to what I'm talking about, um, a brief biology refresher, just so we're all on the same page about some of the terminology I'm using. Um, hey. <laughs> Hold on. Hey, Luz Theron, um, can you go ahead and mute yourself? I'm getting some background. Um, Christine, there will be a test, but only for you. Sorry. I'm just kidding. Okay. So um, just a brief biology refresher. So we're all on the same page about terminology. And, oh, good. Okay. I was um, using my car speaker and it wasn't so great. Awesome. Okay. Uh, glad I changed that. Um, I'm going to talk about some of my personal research, and then I'm going to talk about clinical trials, specifically cancer trials. Um, so the links I posted, I'm going to scroll back up to them. I posted a review on clinical trials, which is pretty good. It's um, an overview of kind of you know, how much they cost, what are the problems with them, why, why do so many of them fail. Um, I posted my manuscript and also my dissertation um, because I'm vain, but also because um, I will be relying on my own personal knowledge and the sources that I'm familiar with. And so those two documents have a, a lot of those items for reference. So if you want to go digging deeper, those documents um, will, will kind of get you there. Um, and then I posted the National Cancer Institute, um, their targeted therapy website, and that gives a, a really good explanation of the different types of cancer treatment and a high level overview about what, what they mean. Um, aw, thanks guys. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so my background, um, my undergraduate degree is in marine and freshwater biology, and I'm obsessed with turtles, but I didn't really know how to find a job um, that, you know, was going to pay the bills, but also connect with humans, because I was really passionate about human medicine. Oh, yes, I just, I fucking love turtles. Okay, so we're not going to talk about turtles today. Um, and then I went to graduate school at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, where I got my PhD in biochemistry and cell biology, and my particular research is on cancer cell signaling. Um, and then from there, I did a brief postdoc, um, hated it, found a small pharmaceutical company in Dallas that was super chaotic, but I learned a lot. And then now I manage clinical trials in oncology. Okay, so quick biology refresher. The central dogma of biology flows DNA to RNA to protein. So your DNA, this is your genetic code. It is just four types of molecules connected together in a double helix that gets unwound. It is transcripted into what's called RNA, which is a lot less stable than DNA. Cool fact, DNA is super stable. That's how we can catch murderers, because when you touch stuff, your DNA gets on it, and it stays there for years. So thank you, DNA. Um, RNA is then translated into amino acids, and these are folded into proteins. And proteins are what I study, so they basically do 
all the important stuff in your cell. And then your cells are what make up your body and your organs and all your tissues. Um, there's two classifications of cells. You have somatic cells. Those are your stem cells that um, they are kind of like the backbone of, of your life and, and growth and body. And um, then you have your um, regular cells that are differentiated from stem cells. And that may come up when we talk about tumors a little bit because you can have mutations in your stem cells and those get passed on to your offspring, but you can also develop mutations in other cells throughout your life. And, and that happens. So this is a perfect segue in my outline where we're going to talk about mutations. So cancer happens when you get a mutation. This can happen... Um, when you're exposed to certain things like um, carcinogens in cigarettes, UV radiation from the sun, um, radiation from nuclear fallout like Chernobyl, um, from asbestos, things like that. Um, you can also just develop mutations when when your body is going DNA to RNA to protein, shit happens. And um, there are DNA repair mechanisms, but they can't catch everything. So over life, you will accumulate mutations, but it, there's a couple things that need to happen before a mutation leads to cancer. And, and we'll talk about that later as well. Um, so it's important to note that Yes, understanding your genetic code is super important in determining um, your health and diseases that might happen, but it's also important to note that before you go and get a genetic analysis done, it doesn't necessarily mean anything bad is going to happen to you because a lot of biology is complicated and um, just because you have a mutation doesn't mean you're going to have cancer. Um, so... Some other important words, phenotype, genotype, and epigenetics. So phenotype, this is the physical expression of your genotype, which is your DNA, your genetic code. Epigenetics is, um, it's a genetic component that is not a part of your genotype, but it can affect your phenotype. So this can be... Um, Proteins that actually bind to the DNA, those play a role in epigenetics because they can kind of control what's expressed. So expression is when a part of your DNA is actually translated into protein and molecules. Um, and not all of your DNA is expressed. Um, there's so many different crazy things about DNA, and I'm not um, a geneticist, so I only have a vague understanding, but it's crazy. It's pretty cool. Um, and I already talked about DNA repair mechanisms. Okay, so my particular research is on a family of proteins called the RAS proteins. And RAS is the most mutated protein in human cancer. So about 30% of all cancers is going to have some type of RAS mutation um, or a mutation in the RAS pathway. So RAS is the starting guy. And I kind of think of it like a marathon relay race. So you have um, your first person that's running and they pass the baton and then they keep running and you're not going to get to the finish line without all of them, but you still need that first guy to start it off. And what gets really complicated with cancer cell signaling is that each one of those components or one of those runners can have something that contributes to uncontrolled cell growth and tumor formation. So. Um, it can get complicated really quickly. And so one of the, ooh, party after party explanation, I don't know what you mean by that. So like you have the first party, which is like the, the best party, but then you have the after party, which can sometimes be cooler than the first party. It just depends on the vibe. But you can't have an after party without the first party. Thank you, Christine, for that beautiful analogy. Um... Da, 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 da. Okay, so um, 
trying to think about where I want to go next. Um, oh, yes. So I another link I posted further up is a picture from Wikipedia of the map kinase signaling pathway. Um, I haven't verified the accuracy 100% of this figure. It's pretty good. Um, it shows the different proteins and the signaling pathway of the ones that, that link to another. So you have the RAS component and then some of the cousins, and you see these arrows. And what's even crazier is it doesn't even show the opposite direction that the arrows can go. So there's a lot of regulatory mechanisms that are happening where it makes sense, right? Um, oh, this is important. RAS controls cell growth. So um, RAS is found in all of your cells in all mammals, and which is convenient for us because we can study mice and other animals and um, make conclusions based on RAS behavior in other animals and kind of um, carry that over into humans. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, so many different proteins are repressing other proteins, are activating other proteins, and all of that is very tightly controlled. So you can imagine when something goes awry, like you have a mutation in your DNA that's telling RAS to be overactive, and RAS is saying, grow, 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 on, 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 and the repressive mechanisms, if they're mutated as well, they're not able to say stop. You have a situation where you have uncontrolled cell growth. Um, and, and this can happen, this mutation can be something that's inherited and RAS is frequently inherited. Um, it can also be introduced by, as I mentioned, outside external forces. Um, and so this is why cancer history is important um, in your health records, because um, family history of cancer is one of the strongest um, risk factors for developing cancer. Um, so usually when tumors form, you have your driver mutation. So this is something like RAS. This is your thing that's pushing on the pedal. It's your driver. Um, and then you usually have a secondary mutation, which is a loss of a tumor suppressor. And tumor suppressors are named after what they do. They suppress tumor growth. And these are your proteins that are your brakes. They say stop cell growth. And this is really important because if you're an embryo, you're a small child, a lot of your um, cells and organs are going to be in growth phase. Um, or when you're um, shedding new skin and you need to grow more. Um, there's other situations where once your heart is fully formed, it's going to stop growing and need something to tell it to stop. And so all of that is very tightly regulated. Um, unfortunately, not only is it hard to find specific inhibitors of drivers, um, it's also... Oh, I totally lost this train of thought. Oh, yeah. So it, not only is it hard to find specific inhibitors of your drivers... There are compensatory mechanisms in all the signaling pathways. And so that's why I posted that photo, because you can, you can imagine that just removing one part, um, it, you have other, other pathways that are able to overcompensate. Now, that's not to say that inhibitors don't work or we shouldn't try to find them. We do need them, and a lot of them do work. But it's, it's really complicated. And oftentimes, if you are suppressing one pathway, um, over time, the tumor can now, it's kind of like natural selection. You've exposed it to something that's targeting the easy to kill portions of the cancer, but you're leaving um, some of the tissue that's lying in wait and you stop that therapy and now it has an opportunity to grow and you've killed off the easy to kill the low hanging fruit portions of the tumor and now it's able to grow and so it's just a totally complicated um scenario and why you know wh there's 
I've seen a misconception on the internet. I know I shouldn't read on the internet. It's a terrible place. Um, but, um, you know, this idea that cancer is one thing, but it's really not. Um, each cancer is very different. And you can imagine, you know, a 60-year-old smoker who has been exposed to a lot of UV radiation pollution in his life. Um, he has, he's older, he's developed more mutations throughout his life. Um, the type of cancer that he develops in his lungs, for example, is vastly different from a brain tumor that is in a child. It's just going to be completely different in its treatment, pathology, how it prevents it, presents itself. Um, and so, you know, yes, we should all strive to be as healthy as we can be, but at the same time, it's, it's complicated and it's no one's fault if they get cancer. It's not because they didn't eat their spinach. Um, or, you know, you hear those stories of someone who lives to like 110 and they like drank every day and smoked every day. And then some people who just are, are expo like get sick a lot. So it just, you know, it's complicated and it's not simple. And I just say that, um, as like a soapbox that, um, you know, don't, don't feel like you need to buy a product that someone's selling you because it, they say it can cure cancer or, you know, I guess it's kind of like, we want to believe that it's simple and that it can be cured, but unfortunately, um, it's not that simple. Um, I'm just going to check the chat really quick. Um, okay. So targeted therapy, what does that mean? So chemotherapy is type of treatment that is not specific to any one type of cancer. Um, this is going to target fast growing cells and, um, it's indiscriminate. So that's why you get a lot of side effects of hair loss. Um, it affects your fingernails, your toenails, because those are, and your, um, digestive tract, because those are uh, high turnover cells. Um, and they grow quickly. So naturally they get targeted by the chemotherapy as well. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, the question is, is it true that there are anti-cancer foods? Uh, for example, um, capsaicin. Um, so yes and no. Um, and leaning towards no. So having a well-balanced and nutritious diet is correlated with lower risk of cancer. But any one type of food does not quite have the power to um, specifically like, stop cancer growth, if that makes sense. And there are um, antioxidants. Oh, okay. Are you talking? I think Oh, capsicum. I'm sorry. I read that too quickly. I actually don't know what that is. Um, and there are like antioxidants, but that's more related to the oxidation pathway, like, um, NADPH, which is a whole separate cell signaling pathway that I don't quite understand. Oh, okay. So capsicum is a bell pepper in Australia. Fun fact. Um, so I don't know much about it. No worries. I, I'm just like reading very quickly in the chat. Um, so interestingly, bell peppers are not actually spicy. And I think it's because they don't have capsaicin, capsaicin, but they have capsicum. They have like a sweet taste. Anyway, um, I am not familiar with that compound. Um, I'll definitely make a note to look it up. But um, yes, you should eat a healthy diet as well-rounded as possible. But again, like eating a bunch of bell peppers is not going to prevent you from ever having cancer in your life. Um, okay. 
Oh, okay. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper into my research. Um, also, broccoli. Yes, you should eat a lot of broccoli. Um, it's kind of like causation versus correlation. We know. <laughs> you could just edit out all my pauses. Um we, we are able to more easily identify correlations than we are causations. And um, there's a book, it's called The Emperor of All Maladies, and it's about cancer, and it is completely fascinating. And it actually talks about how hard it is to actually identify whether something causes cancer or not. Um, it's really good. Um, oh, there's no editing on Stumpinars? Ugh. Okay, well, you this, you guys are just going to get this experience and all its all its live glory. Um, so this book it's written by um, a cancer researcher. Oh, hold on, I think my car battery died. Oh no, I'm good. Everything's fine. Okay, so, <laughs> anyways, um, this book talks about. Um, how long it took to actually identify uh, the link between cigarettes and lung cancer. And yes, there was a lot of pushback from the cigarette lobby, and it's terrible. But aside from that, just uh, being able to exclude all the other um, things in your life that you're exposed to on a daily basis, it's really hard to say this one thing causes cancer. And so, oh, hi, Jim and Walter. So, um, this is why when my mom sends me articles from USA Today that are like, this new thing causes cancer, I don't freak out because I'm like, well, that's not actually what the paper said. And that's why you see all these articles that get picked up by the media, like coffee prevents cancer, Con coffee causes cancer, wine is good, wine is bad. You know, like... It's kind of like um, everything in moderation, you know, so it's going to be hard to pinpoint um, this thing causes this. Um, so don't don't stress about it, but try to be healthy. Listen to your doctor. This is the overall overarching advice. Listen to your doctor. Uh, don't drink too much. Okay. Um, so my research in RAS specifically was um, we, so RAS lives on the plasma membrane. So this is the outside of the cell that keeps all the bad stuff out. Um, well, not really. It just keeps everything where it's supposed to be. So this is composed of lipids. And you might remember from bio class, the lipid bilayer. And I'm going to go on a little bit of a lipid tangent because I'm a lipid person. Um, it's much more complicated than that, which is really cool. Um, it's not just a bilayer. It is a more like an ocean. You, it's fluid. Um, there are... It, this is a, somewhat of a controversial area of research in the lipid field. I know. It's like so crazy, you guys. Lipid drama. Um, they're called lipid rafts, so they kind of, there's density changes, and these platforms kind of float on the membrane bilayer, and, oh, I'm sorry, Anna, am I talking too fast? I can, tend to talk a little bit fast. Yes, lipids are, it's fats, um, but specifically what a lipid is composed of is a polar head group, and then you have a hydrophobic tail, and these tails face inward to each other. So your polar head groups are all facing outward and the polar head groups inside the cell are facing inward inside the cell. And so this is great because it offers a selectivity of what is allowed to cross into the cell. So things that are hydrophobic are able to cross the tails pretty well, but they're also going to have difficulty crossing the polar head groups because those are negatively charged. Um, and what I mean by hydrophobic is they do not have a lot of hydrogen chains, um, or they have more hydrogen chains, less 
carbon double bonds. I don't know. This is where I'm stretching my knowledge. Um, I'm really glad my PhD advisor is not listening because he'd be so upset. Um, anyway, so selectivity. And there are transmembrane proteins that also allow selectivity and allow the passage of molecules. So any medicine that your body is exposed to is going to have to cross this membrane. Um, yes, hydrophobic means it hates water. So, but I'm trying to think, I'm trying to remember like what that means in terms of the molecular, molecular structure. So it's more, um, it's more carbon hydrogen bond. Anyway, this is moving on. Um, notes for me to Google later. So, um, this allows any any time a drug is going to inhibit a protein, it's going to have to find the cells that it needs to find and cross the plasma membrane and then find that protein and inhibit it and also not inhibit other things and mess with the rest of your body and cause side effects. So this is why finding targeted drugs with no side effects is nearly impossible. And there's kind of this pharmacy joke, like what do you call a drug that doesn't have side effects? Um, a drug that doesn't work. Um, just checking the chat real quick. Um, so RAS lives on the plasma membrane inside the cell. And what it does there, it forms clusters, and this is exactly what it sounds like. The RAS proteins cluster together, and they interact with specific lipids and other membrane lipid proteins. And it kind of makes sense that proteins would form complexes like this because, as I mentioned, I talk about, okay, if you want to have an inhibitor, it has to get in the cell, it has to find the protein, it has to inhibit it. These proteins have to interact with each other every day, and a lot of proteins have dual function. So you might have a protein that's involved in cell growth, but it's also involved in a bunch of other things. RAS is the same, um, and the protein I studied that's a RAS cousin is the same as well. It's involved in heart disease, but it's also involved in cancer. Um, so you can imagine the proteins getting to where they need to be is really important. And by clustering together, they form these signaling platforms where they're able to attract lipids that attract other proteins and vice versa. And then um, they're able to activate their downstream partners quickly. Um, and what's interesting is these clusters... Um, kind of form a cohesive signaling unit. So they're all turned on at the same time and they're all turned off at the same time. And they're constantly flexing between the single molecule state and the activated um, state. And in a way, this is able to more effectively propagate the signal. Instead of you have this one lonely protein, he's turned on, he has to find and interact with all these other downstream guys. And it's not very efficient. And your body and your cells are all about efficiency and finding the simplest thing and path um, possible. So um, you have these signaling platforms that are able to all be turned on and find the right components um, and propagate the signal. Why do we care about that? And why do we care about the lipids? Well, um, there is a huge push from the National Cancer Institute to find a RAS inhibitor because so many cancers have a RAS mutation and so many of its downstream effectors have mutations in cancer. And if we can block RAS, that would be huge. Um, just for example, uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which I believe is what Alex Trebek has, it um, has an almost... 0% five-year survival, and 98% of um, these cancers have a specific RAS mutation. 
So um, not all cancers are that RAS addicted, but um, yeah. So being able to target RAS would be awesome. Well, it's really hard. So what our lab studied was how these proteins cluster, and we would do drug screens to find drugs that disrupt the lipids that it interacts with, thereby shutting down its ability to form these clustering and signaling platforms, and thereby halting the downstream signaling. And um, we identified some compounds and are actively testing them in mice. So that's pretty cool. So the whole point of that story is that um, a lot of scientists are trying to think outside the box with what, what do we consider a drug? What do we need it to do? Ultimately, we just needed to stop cell growth. Um, and we want to do it in the least destructive way possible because the rest of your body needs to have cell growth. Any questions? on this portion before I move into clinical trials. So a lipid is, um, let me find a picture. It's a type of macromolecule and it is, I mean, really, it's just, um, this is a good one. Do, 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 copy. Um, so lipid is a molecule that's has a hydrophobic tail and then a hydrophilic water-loving head, which is your polar head group. So polar means it, it likes water. It usually has a negative charge. Um, breaking it down even further, it's carbon chains and phosphates. And then down even further, it's atoms. This is like the bare bones, you guys. Um, what is a boy? P O Y E. Oh, buoy. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, somewhat, but so that would be more like a lipid raft. Um, so one complicated thing about lipids is that they, um, well, cholesterol, it's in your, your plasma membrane that cause it, it kind of breaks up the, um, tight packing of the lipids together and offers fluidity in the membrane because cholesterol is quite small compared to the lipid. And so it just, it's like a bag of sticks and you throw a bunch of marbles in it and the sticks are not going to be able to like stack very well. It's going to be like mixed in with the marbles, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so like there's this new thing called micellar water and I th so a micelle is um, a group of lipids that are in a circle so like all the tails are, are pointing together and the heads are out and it's a way to trap dirt so soap is full of um it, they're called sulfates but they are able to break down, um, I think they're able to break down bacteria by breaking down the, like, lipids, um, the lipid membranes in bacteria. And it's also why um, you need soap to get rid of, like, oil on your hands, because it's going to break down the lipids in that oil that gives it that fatty consistency um and if you just add water like it's not gonna it's not gonna do anything because it's not getting broken down um and that's because the behavior of 
lipids is to pack together so that the hydrophobic regions are protected by the outer water loving phosphate groups. Um, but here's the crazy thing. There's thousands of different types of lipids because you can modify the polar head group and you can modify the hydrophobic chains and their fluidity is changed based on how many hydrogen and, uh, or how many, uh, carbon bonds are present in those tails. So if you have more carbon bonds, the tail is going to be like kinky and not in a sexual way. Um, if you have less carbon double bonds, you're going to have more hydrogen, um, bonds and it's going to be pretty straight and so packed tightly. So trans fats, that's why they're bad for you because trans is describing the orientation of a carbon bond. So trans, it means, um, uh, like, oh man, I need pictures. Um, okay. So saturated fats, saturated fats are more saturated with hydrogen ions. So for every carbon, there's going to be a maximum number of hydrogen bonds. So if you have two carbon connected to each other, you have two, um, hydrogen bonds on either side and your lipid tail is going to be relatively straight. That means it has tighter packing. And this means that your fat is more likely to be solid at room temperature versus your fat that's less packly, tightly packed density. You have less um, saturation, less hydrogen bonds, more double bonds, the tails are kinkier. It's less tightly packed. You can't stack the lipids one on top of each other. And you're going to, your this fat is going to have, uh, it's more likely to be liquid at room temperature. So that's why butter, um, and lard, they're more unhealthy for you because, um, they have more saturated carbon chains, um, versus your olive oils, which are liquid at room temperature. And when those lipids get in your body, um, they, they're in your body. So, um, the way fats get processed, they have to be stored. Um, the fat in your bloodstream, like it gets clogged in your heart. Um, so, oh, brown fat versus regular fat. So that's actually brown fat versus white fat. It's the type of fat cell. And I actually don't know much more than that. Okay, so I'm totally unsurprised I went on a lipid tangent because I love lipids. Okay, any further questions? Yay, learning! Um, oh, yeah, so Aradia, like, handedness. Yeah, like, like, oh, my God, I just, I, I need visual aids for this. Um, okay. So I'm going to move on. We got really in the weeds, which is awesome. And let's talk about, um, let's talk about clinical trials and have no shame in eating the crispy fat from steak. I mean, everything in moderation, right? Um, okay. So clinical trials. All right. The, I saw an article on LinkedIn that was a survey of the most hated industry and pharmaceutical industry was the number one, which is totally unsurprising. So let's talk about why things cost so much and why it's like a little bit so hated. So um, let's start with how do you actually get from the lab to a drug in humans? First, you have your computational biologists, and they're able to screen thousands of compounds, and they can do protein modeling and find, um, you know, things that inhibit a protein in a theoretical computational setting. And this is, the, the advantage here is that you can study a whole bunch of compounds and a whole bunch of scenarios. Downside, of course, it's a computational model. It's not an accurate reflection of 
true biology in a human or in a cell. From there, you can winnow it down and tweak these um, compounds. And actually, here's what's, what's cool about computational biology is that in our lab collaborated with a computational biology lab. So we were able to go back and forth between the two. And what, what you can do is upload an actual drug and run it into your program and see what, how it's inhibiting a protein. Like what, what is the drug, what is this drug interacting with? What are the atoms that are, that are interacting? So that's pretty cool. Um, from there, when it went down even further, you can um, perfect your molecule. You can collaborate with a medicinal chemist. And this is still all in the lab. Um, they can modify the structure, make it a little better, make it inhibit your protein better. From there, you go to your uh, biological models. So these are your cells, your mice, your organoids, um, stem cells. Um, we have a bunch of different tools, worms, and there's pluses and minuses to all of those. Um, mice, they're more expensive. They take time to grow, but they're great because, again, they have a relatively short life cycle. We can genetically modify them quite easily. They're not that vastly different from humans. We have types of mice called xenograft. And these are mice that have had their immune system um, mostly depleted. They don't have hair. And we can inject them with human cells. And so they grow human tissue. And that's why they need their immune systems repressed so that they don't attack the human cells. And we can grow human tumors in mice. We can treat them with drugs. We can, they're, they don't have fur, so we can see the tumors on their skin growing or shrinking. Um, we can basically, um, like, genetically make their genome whatever we want it to be. And yes, we have killed a lot of animals for science. I don't love it. I, I don't see an alternative at this point because... For clinical trials, a clinical trial is um, your human studies, and phase one is often your first in human study, and it's just unethical to give people a drug that we don't know what it does. And the only way we can figure out what it does in a biological setting, a mammalian setting, is to give it to animals. And... Uh, I even hate saying this, but we tested in animals that are more developed than mice, and it sucks. But I run, like, studies that have children as young as a year old. It's just you can't give them something that you don't have preclinical work showing um, what it does. So that sucks. I think we can get to a place where we don't have to use animals. Um, but unfortunately, that's where we are today. Um, so you have your cell work, your cell lines. Um, if people have heard of Henrietta Lacks, there was a um, documentary on HBO. She was a woman who had an incredibly aggressive form of ovarian cancer. Um, and her cells were um, extracted by her physician without her knowledge and consent, um, then grown in the lab. And um, they're called HeLa cells. They stand for her name, Henrietta Lacks. I've used them. We've all used them. And what's incredible is that when you're growing these cell lines, and they're called immortal cell lines because they are taken from cancers that are going to grow and grow and grow and never stop. And um, the biology of these cells change when you've been growing them in, in labs for all these years. And that's the downside with cell studies is because um, you, like the, you can't always control how they change. And that's a downside. Um, so 
So Arady is making a note. She was an African-American woman featured in Emergency Skin by N.K. Jemison, the short story she plugged a while back. So it's fascinating. It is the whole story is um, complicated by um, racism and American politics and how we deal with people's tissue. Um, how do we compensate people for that? It's fascinating. Um, so the use of cells, it's really important, but again, you know, we can't always control how the cells change in a lab setting. And here's, here's something that's kind of funny. Um, again, you hear stories about, um, a drug is tested in the lab. It kills tumor cells. It gets picked up by, by the media. Well, the way we grow these cells in the lab, like you can kill tumor cells by putting Coca-Cola on them, they will die. Like you can put water on them and they will die because they're just cells. Um, the problem is there's a lot of ways we can kill cancer, but you want to keep the person alive. So that's the hard part. Um, and that's why there are so many horrible side effects with cancer drugs because um, it's really hard to target them and isolate the thing that's giving us problems and then not affect everything else. Um, I need to see my notes. Okay. So the path, ah, the path to approval, um, it's a really high failure studies and drugs are failing at this stage and then they get to human studies your clinical trials oh no oh hold on hold on everything good okay um so you a lot of drugs fail in the preclinical stage uh, before they even get to clinical trials and here's the catch-22 with all of this. I'm sure there's a lot of drugs that have failed at the preclinical stage that would be awesome in humans. But you have to go through all those steps because how can you justify testing something in a higher-order animal where you've tested it in mice? How can you justify testing it in mice when you haven't tested it on cells? And all, and so and so. So, um... At, you've got this drug. It at this point it has been worked on for five or so years from the computational stage, maybe even ten years. And now it's awesome. Your data is awesome, and you want to run a clinical trial and test in humans. So you write an application to the FDA, and I'm going to focus on. Um, the American side of this, the process is different for the European Health Agency and how they do it in Australia. Um, but I know mostly about how it's done in the U.S., so I'm going to focus on that. Um, a lot of times trials are open in multiple countries, and that's where I get involved. It gets complicated from a paper side. So um, you want to test it in humans. You go through... You apply to the FDA, they get back to you, um, you write a protocol, um, and in your protocol, you specify the patient population that you're targeting, um, who is excluded, who is included, and it's really important that the protocol is designed effectively so that you get the best data possible um, with minimizing human, um, you know, side effects and pain. So your phase one, this is usually just a safety study. Um, efficacy is not really tested at all, except as a secondary endpoint, if you happen to get enough data. Um, it's one arm, so you don't have a control group. With cancer studies, and this is most of my experience, in cancer studies, it's not ethical to use cancer drugs on healthy patients. Um, a lot of times the drugs are carcinogens themselves. 
a lot of times they're combined with chemotherapy backbone, which again um, can be carcinogenic. Um, but a lot of times your phase one study is healthy subjects, um, but we're focusing on cancer. So these people have cancer. Um, and at this point, you kind of just want to see what's the highest dose we can give someone without giving them side effects. Um, with cancer studies, the cancer gives them side effects. So it's important to track all of them and see, and also to have compared to the preclinical data to see which of these side effects do we expect because these patients have cancer or, or which ones do we suspect are from the drug. Um, so that's your phase one. Then you're going to lose like a quarter to half of the drugs at this stage. Um, they're going to have intolerable side effects. Um, they, it's clear that they're not really doing anything to help the cancer. If, if the data is so bad in that regard, it might fail at that stage. Um, at this point, approximately, um, close to a billion dollars has been invested. Um, the approximation at phase three is about one and a half billion dollars. The estimate of total cost, so this is like your loss of investment, not including like the lab to trial stage is like two and a half billion. It's just a crazy amount of money. So that's your phase one. Then let's say it looks really good. The side, the side effects are not terrible. You move on to phase two. So this is where you might have a dose escalation. Um, so you, you want to ramp up that dose higher to see if you can um, kill the cancer more effectively. Maybe from your phase one data, you can winnow the population a little bit better to identify um, oh, we think that the genetic profile of these patients might be more favorable with this drug, um, things like that. And then when you move to phase three, this is your efficacy study. So this is where you have a control arm, and it's actually quite rare for your control to be a placebo with a cancer study. Um, so usually this will be um, like you'll compare it against your standard of care, so maybe another drug that's on the market or you might compare it to just chemotherapy alone and your drug mixed with chemotherapy. Um, and so ideally with cancer treatment, you're gonna have something that is targeting the fast growing cells. And then if it's okay drug wise to mix it with your new drug, um, you might pair it with your new drug that's a targeted therapy that's inhibiting a protein that's mutated in this type of cancer. Um, or it inhibits a protein that's involved in a lot of different cancers. So you have a basket study where everyone has a different type of cancer um, and you're seeing if it's effective in multiple types. Um, or, um, so that's like a targeted therapy that's a drug that's inhibiting a protein. You might have an immunotherapy that's trying to ramp up your immune system to, to take care of the cancer. Um, so then from there, and, and there's constant reporting to the FDA at the end of each phase, you have to get approval to move to the next step. Protocol amendments happen quite frequently. Um, there's back and forth between, um, the doctors and the pharmaceutical companies and the FDA about the types of patients that are being chosen for the study. The FDA really wants the, the trials to be a reflection of the patient population. So this means people that are going to be older, more sickly, that, are, that their results are going to be um, combined with people that are younger and more healthier. Um, if you have a, a population that is, um, you know, a little bit weaker, uh, more advanced stage of their disease, the data might show that the results are not so great. Um, it could be that maybe a younger, more, um, you know, hale population is able to tolerate the drug better and it's great for those patients. So it's very complicated. Um, 
And um, at each of these stages, things are modified and changed. And um, at each step, there's doctors and clinical scientists, um, safety specialists who are reviewing all this data, biostatisticians. It's a lot of people, costs a lot of money. At this point, you're, let's say your data is awesome. You get this drug um, and then you submit a um, new drug application, an NDA. And based on that, the FDA decides if your drug is going to get a label or not. Um, they say, yes, it's approved. At this point, you can put it on the market. You set a price. Um, and then phase four is post-approval. So this is um, data collection. Uh, and it's, it's reached a wider population. So now that something is on the market, it's going to be able to reach more people um, whereas like phase one, you might have 10 to 50 people, phase two, 100 to 300, phase three, a um, couple hundred to a couple thousand. But I've worked on phase threes where we had hardly any people because it was just super rare genetic subset. So it kind of depends on what you're testing. Um, so you get a label, phase four, data collection begins, a price is set. And um, I'm super passionate about healthcare in the U.S. and it's a mess and I want everything to be cheaper. Um, but it's a, a lot of why it's so expensive is because of the cost. Um, and a lot of times when a drug is really good, um, it might get purchased up by a larger pharmaceutical company just because they have the funds to be able to develop. Um, there's also um, incentives to investigate rare diseases. Um, so a rare disease would be less than 200,000 people in the United States either have it or are diagnosed with it. I can't remember um, the exact metric, but there are um, incentives to identify drugs that get approved for these patients and you get six months. Um, patent exclusivity. So that means no one else can work on development of a competitor of a generic. Um, and sometimes that exclusivity, I think, can be extended based on, um, again, other incentives. I'm not sure my warder would have to weigh in. But um, yeah, so then, but once something's on the market, then after a certain time period has ended, competition can come in and prices are, are lowered. Um, so, Aradia asked a question, are computer models also used to select the populations for the clinical trials? No. So, um, a lot of medical doctors are weighing in at this point um, because they have the most insight about the um, treatment, the patient population, and um, who's going to be a good candidate. Um, so, a lot of um, non-clinical scientists um, are at the early stages where my lab was very early and then clinical trials, um, you have a lot more like MDs weighing in on the study and the research. And I think that's all I have ending exactly at seven. Any questions? Thank you guys. You're welcome. Um, anyone can DM me for any further questions. Um, if there's anything that you wanted to learn more about, I can help point you in the direction um, to read up on things. So thank you everyone for joining in. Um, and have a great day. I'm going to sign off, but I'll be in and out of the chat. Um, seeing what's up with everyone. So... Love you all. Bye.